A Patriot's History of the United States, Chapter 16, Part 8, Re-Election and Inevitability. Roosevelt kept his intentions to run for re-election a secret for as long as he could. Faced with war in Europe, FDR had decided to run, but he wanted his candidacy to appear as a draft Roosevelt movement. He even allowed a spokesman to read an announcement to the Democratic National Committee, stating that he did not want to run. It was grandstanding at its worst, but it had the desired result. Echoes of, we want Roosevelt, rang out in the convention hall. The draft worked, and FDR selected Henry Wallace, the Secretary of Agriculture, and a man far to the left of Roosevelt, as a new vice president. Against the incumbent president, the Republicans nominated Wendell Wilkie, chief executive of the Commonwealth and Southern Corporation, a utility company. Wilkie, in addition to being a businessman, was also an Indiana lawyer and farmer, owning two farms he actually farmed, in contrast to the country squire Roosevelt. Wilkie actually managed to gain some traction against Roosevelt on the economic front, arguing that the New Deal had failed to eliminate mass unemployment. Still later, he tried to paint FDR as a warmonger. Without a clear vision for a smaller state America, Wilkie was doomed. In the re-election, Roosevelt racked up another Electoral College victory with a margin of 449 to 82. But in the popular vote, the Republicans narrowed the margin considerably, with 22 million votes to FDR's 27 million. Once again, the Democrats controlled the big cities with their combination of political machines and government funds. In charging Roosevelt with desiring war, Wilkie failed to appreciate the complex forces at work in the United States or the president's lack of well-thought-out strategy. Throughout 1939-1940, Roosevelt seemed to appreciate the dangers posed by the fascist states, though not Japan in the same degree. However, he never made a clear case for war with Germany or Italy, having been lulled into a false sense of security by the Royal Navy's control of the Atlantic. When he finally did risk his popularity by taking the case to the public in early 1940, Congress gave him everything he asked for and more, giving lie to the position that Congress wouldn't have supported him even if he had provided leadership. Quite the contrary, Congress authorized 1.3 million tons of new fighting ships, some of which went to sea at the very time Japan stood poised to overrun the Pacific. And overall, Congress voted $17 billion for defense. The president appointed two former Republicans to defense positions, namely Henry Stimson as Secretary of War and Frank Knox as Secretary of the Navy. Both those men advocated for much more militant positions than did Roosevelt, favoring, for example, armed escorts for U.S. shipping to Britain. Hitler's massive air attacks on England, known as the Battle of Britain, began in July 1940 to prepare for Germany's Operation Sea Lion, the invasion of England. Although Roosevelt's advisors glumly expected Britain to fall, The British use of radar, combined with Churchill's timely attacks on Germany by long-range bombers and the highly secret ultra-code-breaking program, saved the day. By October, the Royal Air Force had turned back the Luftwaffe. But Britain remained isolated, broke, and under increasing danger of starvation because of U-boat attacks on merchant ships. At about the time the British had survived Germany's aerial attacks, Mussolini attempted to expand the Southern Front by invading Greece. With British support, the Greeks repulsed the Italians. Britain then counterattacked in Africa, striking at the Italian forces in Libya. Mussolini's foolishness brought the Nazi armies into North Africa, and with great success at first. General Erwin Rommel took only 11 days to defeat the British and chase them back to Egypt. Yugoslavia, Greece, and Crete also fell, joining Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria under German rule. At that point, during a critical juncture in world history, 
Two factors made American intervention to save Britain unnecessary in military terms, and yet critical in the long run for stabilizing Western Europe for decades. First, following a November 1940 raid by the Royal Navy, the Italian fleet at Taranto had to withdraw to its ports, ceding sea control of the Mediterranean to the British. This made it difficult, though not impossible, for Hitler to consider smashing the British ground troops in Egypt and marching eastward toward India, where he entertained some thoughts of linking up with the Japanese. As long as the British had free reign of the Mediterranean, resupply of such an effort would have to be conducted overland. The second critical development was Hitler's decision to invade the Soviet Union in June 1941. In part, the Soviet invasion was inevitable in Hitler's mind. Since Mein Kampf, he had clung to the notion that Poland and Western Russia represented the only hope for Germany's overpopulation. As a result, when the bombs fell in Hawaii on December 7, 1941, the shocking unpreparedness of American forces and the disastrous defeat at Pearl Harbor generated criticism of Roosevelt from both sides. Although he had balked at expanding the army and thereby possibly losing an election, he oversaw a program building six Iowa-class battleships and 11 Essex-class carriers. In addition, the embargo on critical materials to Japan, machine tools, steel, then scrap, squeezed the empire. FDR followed the Japanese occupation of Indochina, Vietnam, and the Nazi invasion of the USSR in July 1941 with an embargo of oil and placed Japan in a situation similar to Germany in 1914, in which Japan had to act soon and perhaps recklessly or risk losing all her gains. Given the Japanese militarism and belief in their own cultural superiority, Japan's choice was never in doubt. And we'll start on chapter 17 in the next video. Please like, subscribe, and leave a comment below. I'd love to hear from you guys. I love you. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now.